What's up hobby friends? In this three-part video series, I'm going to be showing you how I painted Baron Mordo for Marvel Crisis Protocol. In this video, I'm going to be covering the preparation for the miniature as well as how I painted the base. This will cover the stones, the runes, the smoke, as well as the non metal metal on the sewer grate and manhole cover. To prime the miniature, we're using Vallejo Surface Primer Black. To paint the khaki stone, we're using AK Graphite, Scale Color Star Brown, Mojave White, and White Sands. To paint the Terracotta Stone, we're using Scale Colors Indian Shadow, Kalahari Orange, Basic Flesh, and then Vallejo's Tan Earth and Ice Yellow. To paint the Yellow Runes, we're using AK Burnt Orange, Volcanic Yellow, Yellow, Vallejo's Ice Yellow, AK White, and then some glazes with Vallejo Game Ink Yellow. To paint the white smoke, we're using AK Graphite, Medium Sea Gray, Pale Gray, Scale Colors White Sands, and AK White. To paint the non metal metal sewer grate, we're using AK Dark Sea Blue, Gray Blue, Spectrum Blue, and Vallejo Ivory. To paint the copper manhole cover, we're using Scale Colors Indian Shadow, AK Saddle Brown, Deep Brown, Vallejo Ice Yellow, and then some Games Workshop Nail Hack Oxide. For the prep for Baron Mordo, nothing really remarkable to note. I have built the entire model as per normal, and I've glued him to the base. He's actually far sturdier than you would think, given how twisty and bendy this energy is. Although, I do have to note that this one little section right here, there is a bit of wobble to it. So you want to be careful that you don't accidentally hit or knock the model with your hand, because that is a weak point that I see breaking very, very easily. Prime the model with Vallejo Surface Primer Black, and we've given the base coat, at least the khaki stone element, a base coat of AK's Graphite and some Scale Color Thar Brown. And this is going to be the base coat for building up our stone. I'm just skipping some of the base coat step by doing an airbrush pass first. Otherwise, the model builds remarkably easily. There's no real gaps to uh, speak of. It goes together nice and smoothly. So the Marvel Crisis Protocol bases, I know this is a 3D print, but the thing, the same theory applies to the actual bases provided by Marvel Crisis Protocol. And you can use this technique for painting your own bases and even other materials as well. When you have something that's completely flat and smooth without any actual sculpted surface texture or details, one of the ways that we can introduce that element and add an extra layer of information to our painting is to actually use our brush strokes as we're shading and as we're highlighting and layering up to help create and i'm not talking about like a physical texture but to highlight up in a way that creates the texture itself so what we're going to be doing is when we're painting and working up our highlights we're going to be using a bit of an older brush something that isn't quite as sharp of a tip and we're going to be using our brush strokes to sort of sketch in, imply, and create these cool patterns, these shapes, these lines, these blots of color. And as we work up, we start picking out and defining these shapes, highlighting them accordingly. And through this process, we end up adding a level of surface texture to something that would otherwise be flat and boring. So the colors that you're going to be using for your own bases don't necessarily matter. I'm painting a khaki stone and a terracotta stone, and these are the colors I've chosen. The technique applies no matter what colors you're using. We're basically working our way through a mid or a dark tone up through to our highlight. So if you're painting more traditional pavement, you might use more neutral grays or grays that lean into the blues. If you're uh, painting for a dirt texture, you might use more browns. If you're painting for alien stone, maybe you'll use more greens or purples or reds. The color choices are up to you, the technique is the same, and for this reason, I'm only really going to show you with the terracotta, the khaki stone, sorry. Painting it with the terracotta stone is exactly the same technique, and all we're doing is we're working our way up through base coats into our highlights. So I'm using graphite and thar brown. This is already a 50-50 mix I've applied with the airbrush for the base coat. So when we go by hand, we're going straight from thar brown into Mojave White. And then White Sands is something I use very sparingly. 
For the most part, I go up to Mojave White for something that's flat like this. If there is rubble or debris or something extra that I want to pick out. So for example, on Doctor Strange's base, these cracked pieces of stone, pavement, and rubble that are more lifted out, I might take those to a little brighter white sands highlight just to help differentiate the rest of the debris and the rubble from the special pieces that I want to draw attention to. The terracotta stone, I'm using Indian shadow as my base coat, and then I'm mixing up through Kalahari orange into basic flesh for my highlights. I don't go all the way to pure basic flesh, but maybe a 50-50 is my final highlight. So on top of my base coat, if you're doing this by hand, you'll have to base coat with the graphite on far brown. Because we've already done that with the airbrush, we're skipping ahead. And we're going straight with far brown with a bit of dilution. And you can tell that my brush isn't super sharp. And it's important that it's not super sharp because we won't be able to get very interesting shapes um, with a very pointed tip, which is counterintuitive, you would think, that you would want the tip to be as sharp as possible. But very often when you're painting these large surfaces, having too sharp a tip or too small of a brush actually hinders you from being able to coat um, nicely or sometimes get these cool textures that we're looking for. The first important step is to understand or realize where our highlights are coming from. So on this model, Wong is going to be facing kind of this direction, and so my highlights are coming from this way. So we're going to highlight accordingly, and as we're highlighting, you can see that I'm just sort of just making big, broad, quick strokes across the stone. I'm not trying to be too precise about it. I'm not trying to get a super thin, um, super even coat. I'm looking to use my brush strokes to imply texture. I'm creating patterns across the surface that I'm going to be building off of as I continue to highlight. Now, I'm not going super diluted with this. I'm simply using the moisture that's on my wet palette and the natural dilution of the paint straight out of the pot to apply this first pass. This also allows the paint to dry very quickly and we can work up through our highlights without having to wait for the paint to dry. Now what I'm doing is I'm continuing to do more and more passes of this Thar Brown. And as I'm continuing to build up of previous layers, I'm starting to pick out these cool little patterns. I'm seeing little dots here. Um, maybe this is a bit of a line that I want to accentuate. Uh, some more dots here. And this is what I mean as I'm building up these layers of color, these layers of highlights. I'm starting to pick up that interesting shape or shapes that I want to continue to highlight, create my stone texture. And I'm keeping it a very organic process. I'm not trying to be too rigid or firm with it. Um, as I paint, I'll discover, I'll refine, I'll hide, and I'll create more shapes. With this process, you want to just move quickly. Moving quickly means that you don't have the time to be precise, and it's this imprecision that allows us to create these cool organic shapes. On a flat surface like this too, it might be cool to maybe paint a, a jagged line that we can then start to accentuate and highlight like a crack. Just remember that if you do so, cracks naturally have shadows and dips, so when we highlight that, we're going to want to leave some darker elements on the opposite to reflect the light bouncing and uh, creating a highlight. Once we've applied a couple of coats of pure Thar Brown, we're going to start mixing our Mojave White, and we're just going to progressively add our highlights in, focusing more and more on the front. Now out of the pot, um, Mojave White is fairly diluted and you're going to want to do quite a few coats to one, build up your color, but this also means that we're able to, through its natural dilution, build up very thin colors. We're not applying a super thick coat right out of the pot and this allows us to just very easily, without much, much work, build up our color. Now you can see that these shapes that I've created beforehand, initially with my Thar Brown sketch, these blobs of color, I'm starting to highlight as if they were naturally sculpted. 
with my light source determined, for example, there's a little blob right here. So if I imagine that the light's coming from here, this front element is going to receive a highlight and I will leave this back in shadow. And do the same for all of these other little dots. If I want to put a line right here, sort of like a crack, I'll work some highlights working backwards away from my light source, but then where that line exists, I might want to leave some of this dark brown showing to help simulate that shadow side of the crack. And as we work our way progressively up to pure Mojave White, we want to make sure that we focus our highlighting towards the front where our light source is. And then that's when we're going to start to really pick out some of these edges, some of these cracks. I don't do any mortar in between my khaki bases or my khaki stone, only in the terracotta. One of the other reasons that we choose to use an old ratty brush for this as opposed to something newer, the technique or the motion that we're doing with our brush is a lot of stippling. It's a lot of hammering and smashing the brush onto the surface. If you had a new tip on this, I guarantee you it wouldn't stay new for very long. So I like to recycle some of my older brushes that don't necessarily maintain a good tip, but still have um, a fairly decent bristle to it. I can't paint fine detail, but then at that point, I can start to use the brush for textural work exactly like this. You can see that because my light source is coming from this direction, as I work towards the back, I'm spending less and less time here. And I'm gonna do the same thing on the terracotta stone as well. I'm gonna be focusing a lot of my attention right here and right here along this edge and this plane. Once the model is sat here, a lot of this should be in shadow as well and won't have as much attention. Now, if you feel like you wanna highlight the edges even further, or again, bring up some of these highlights even more, you can introduce some white sands, touch up the edges, um, refine those a bit. I'm choosing not to, again, mainly because this is the color that the majority of my khaki bases are. And I only really reserve this for debris or on elements where I need to lift up. This is also fairly close to white, so you want to use this sparingly. Um, you don't want too much of this on the base competing for attention because it will be a relatively bright color value speaking. And you want to give yourself room on the actual model itself to play around with the depth of value. What we're going to do is we're going to do the exact same thing for the terracotta stone using these colors, base coat, and then highlighting all the way through. The technique is the same as when we painted the khaki stone, so I'm not gonna show you this on camera. I also do wanna preface that this may not be the specific base that I am painting for the model in this tutorial video, but because the techniques are the same throughout, I'm recording this as a generic video and I can use it for all of my clips ahead where I use the exact same techniques for painting the base. So you can see that we've now painted the terracotta base in a very similar manner to the khaki base. Because I have a larger surface area to play with, I've really gone and created and painted in these cool little lines. I've continued to highlight up. There's these dots and patches of color that I've highlighted up in various levels of value to help create a little bit of variety in the patterning. And then because the model that I'm gonna be attaching to this base sits right here, um, a lot of this is going to be in shadow, and so I've chosen not to highlight the back portion of this stone. I've also picked out the edges, brightening up along these pla uh, planes or edges that face towards the light as they will be brighter, and then a little darker on the back where we're getting some light reflection off of this stone. What we're going to do now is we're going to be painting the mortar in between, and I'm using a fine detail brush for this. You're going to want to dilute your paint to make sure that the brush and the paint can flow nicely. And we're using our tan earth and ivory from Vallejo for this. We're starting with our base coat of tan earth. And you'll have to do a couple of passes to get a nice even coat of this. If you do overpaint, not a super big deal. 
I personally think it's kind of cool to have a bit of that mortar bleeding onto the stone. Sort of like it was imperfectly applied. Now, because this base is a 3D printed base, this stone texture or this mortar texture in between the stones is a little harder to, to apply because it is a deeper crevice than what is present on the bases from the official Marvel Crisis Protocol models. There, the crevices aren't quite as deep and you'll have an easier time painting in these lines. And once the tan earth is dry, we're gonna take our Vallejo Ice Yellow. We're gonna to wanna to make sure that it's fairly diluted. We want it to flow very nice and easily. And we're gonna start focusing on highlighting these cracks. Now again, because this is deeper than the official Marvel Crisis Protocol bases, it is a little trickier, but with a thin brush and enough dilution, it shouldn't be a problem. Now I am overpainting a little bit because of the depth of this crack and how narrow it is. When you're painting something larger like uh, a crack or some sort of tear in the stone, and I'll show you in a second on some other Marvel bases, you can afford to go a little lighter with this. I'm just gonna paint this into the cracks. You wanna make sure that using a very thin brush with a very fine pointed tip, and then the paint being diluted will help us to get the paint into the crevices. I'm not worried if it's not perfectly even. I wanna make sure that it's brightest right here on the corner and right here where the stones meet at this T intersection. I'm gonna do a few passes to make sure that the ice yellow has a nice even thick coat. And then the dilution of the paint as I pull it away will naturally dilute it into the darker areas. So to paint the orangey yellow runic circles on Baron Mordo's base, we're using a progression of orange to yellow to ivory off-white, and then finally white colors from AK and Vallejo. AK burnt orange, volcanic yellow, yellow, ice yellow, and white. And then we have some game ink yellow from Vallejo, and this will help to bump up the saturation and the intensity of our color. These are the colors I have on hand. This is the current recipe that I like using for these kinds of sort of orange yellow things. I use the same recipe on my ancient one and I would really like it. So I'm using it for consistency. The exact colors that you choose to use don't really matter. It just depends on what you have available, what you prefer to use. The key is to not jump right into your mid or bright tones. We need to start with a solid base tone and then progressively work our way up. We're gonna be doing a lot of intermediary tones. We're mixing in intermediate steps in between these colors and then these colors and then these colors, and then these colors. It's also easy to want to start off with white primer and just do like a yellow or an orange glaze or a wash and call it done. There are a couple of reasons why this won't work very well. One, I think it looks lazy. Um, it also becomes difficult to correct any sort of mistakes if you have to go back in and touch up the um, yellow or orange yellow in this case. Let's say you overpaint something and you have to correct um, or at some point revisit. If you've done a contrast or ink wash on top of white primer, you're not going to be able to match that exact tone again if you try and correct. No matter how hard you do it, it's easier and better to learn how to do it through a progression of colors. We're also doing the yellows first and then jump and then jumping into the we're also doing the yellows first before jumping to doing the white smoke because I've actually found if we overpaint the yellow onto the white, we also have that hard issue where it's a lot of work to go back in and correct and bring it back up to pure white again. We're starting from a mid-tone gray, working our way up to white. And if we were to overpaint onto finished white, we'd have to jump all the way back to that mid-tone gray and work our way up again. So we're jumping with the yellows and oranges first, once that out of the way, we can then carefully paint the white and gray of the smoke. The way I'm going to approach highlighting these runes as well, I imagine that he's stepping in the center of each of them. 
and where he steps, he's making a point of contact. We're seeing a flare of energy. So my highlights will be centered around the center and fading out as they expand to the outside. Additionally, uh, much like a, a flame, the more recency of the step, the more intense or the brighter the highlight, the energy spot. So this one's probably going to be more yellow, yellow and white, yellow, orange, and more orange with a hint of yellow as it's fading off. I'm probably also not going to overspray and do sort of any glow in the white smoke. I want it to be sort of clean and kind of a separate thing. In the films, there's no smoke when he actually jumps around. So I think this is more just a design choice from AMG to actually have the model suspended in the air in a way that makes sense. So we're just going to paint this like magical smoke entirely separate from the actual runic energies itself. One thing I want to call out with the AK Volcanic Yellow, this color in its pure form has some greenish tone to it. And I have yet to find a way to knock back that, that green tint. So I don't like using pure volcanic yellow. It does, however, provide a nice intermediary step between the burnt orange and the yellow. So I like using it in between here in this recipe. We start from the burnt orange and we work our way up to about a pure 50-50 mix of orange and volcanic yellow. From there, we introduce yellow until we're at pure yellow. And then from there, it's just a simple matter of working our way through progressive steps up to ice yellow and into white. Once we've done our highlights, we want to make sure that we're getting a strong dark to mid to bright tone contrast jump or value jump. Because once we applied the game ink yellow washes and glazes on top of it, it will knock back the intensity of some of our highlights. If we don't have that strong range of value already laid in, the game ink yellow is going to knock back a lot of our highlights and it won't feel as rich and vibrant. So when we're doing these highlights initially, you want to make sure that you're really pushing those values. Work up to pure ice yellow and white and don't be afraid to be very generous with your highlight placement. Once we've done our yellow ink glaze, we'll go back in with ice yellow and white and just refine and polish those highlights. You may also want to know um, that because the white is going to be adjacent to smoke, to not overdo it on the white either. I might really only limit the white to where his actual foot is stepping off and the rest of it's probably going to be ice yellow and yellow. So we're going to start by doing a base coat of burn orange. We're going to keep our paint fairly diluted. We don't want it to be too thick, but we don't want it to be too watery either. And we're just going to gently paint it into all of the rooms and make sure we get all the recesses. If it's too watery and you go too quickly, the paint forms sort of a film um, or some sort of a bubble connecting all the little gaps. And when it dries, it's going to create an actual physical film. But to avoid that, we just want to very gently, very slowly paint in the ruins to avoid uh, those bubbles forming. You'll want to do two or three uh, nice thin coats to get even coverage. The real key is to make sure that you're getting all of the insides of the runes painted. So we've done about four passes, five in some areas with the burnt orange. We've got a nice even base coat and we're now going to start taking our volcanic yellow and we're just going to mix in small amounts into our burnt orange and we're going to start building up some color. Now, unfortunately, again, this yellow or just yellows in general, have very poor coverage, very, very transparent paints. So it's going to take quite a few layers and quite a lot of time and work to just build up your colors. So I recommend putting on a good podcast, film, music, and just taking your time with this. You don't want to try and apply too many layers of thick paint too quickly. You'll end up with a chunky finish and it's not going to look polished at all. Your best bet is just to go with diluted paint, very thin layers, and build up your color. We're going to preserve the insides and all of the crevices with our burnt orange, and we're just going to slowly build up into our yellows. What will make this easier as we progress through our highlights is the brighter and brighter we get, the more we're focusing in on the inner portion of the circle. 
So we're going to be highlighting less and less of the ex external edge, which will mean less work for us as we progress. So I'm just gently mixing in more and more again of my volcanic yellow until we reach about halfway. Again, once we start getting into pure volcanic yellow, the paint pigment tends to take on a bit of a greenish tone and I want to try and avoid that. So once we hit that 50-50 mark, we're gonna start introducing pure yellow. Now on these rims, there is a bit of a lip on the edge here. Just wanna take your time with the edge or the tip of your brush and highlight that edge, but leaving the crevices in that burnt orange color. And then once we hit that 50-50 mix of volcanic yellow to burnt red, or burnt orange, sorry, we're gonna start introducing yellow. Now this will immediately brighten it up and you can see that as we're building up these tones of oranges into yellows, it does get easier and easier to lay down this yellow color. And we're just slowly building up this progressive highlight. As we bring it to yellow, we can start to think about creating, not necessarily patterns, but little pockets of brightness and energy in the circle. Now, as I outlined in the very beginning, uh, painting this section, I like to imagine these as sort of responsive to physical touch, uh, impacts from the environment, things like that. And so if we're gonna be working around and painting the smoke, why not incorporate the smoke into, uh, and how it interacts with this energy circle? So what I'm gonna be doing is, in addition to highlighting from the center where Ordo stepped on. We're also going to highlight the edges or the curves where it's contacting the smoke and treating it also as a point or source of highlight. And this way we're not just getting a one flat boring blend, but we're adding little additional pockets of highlights and color. And we're going to continue working this up until we hit pure yellow. And then once we hit the pure yellow, we're going to keep introducing right into the ice yellow. And at this point now, we're starting to really focus in on tightening up where we're placing the highlights. I'm going to mainly restrict it to this inner ring right here and then maybe these outer circles just on the inner inner edge the trick is to not overdo this ice yellow highlight use just enough to suggest a really bright intense point of of energy or of light and then you leave the rest of it yellow to suggest the overall color of the object Now from the yellow into the ice yellow, we're not doing too many passes, not many highlights. We're just keeping our paints nice and thin and glazing in the layers of color. Maybe I'll put some right here on the edge, this inner edge of the runes. And then we're going right to ice yellow. What I'm also gonna do with the ice yellow, I think is add a very, very thin edge highlight on some of these big circles right here. I expect that the yellow ink glaze is going to knock back the strength of this and bring it more in line with yellow, but it should just leave a very, very thin highlight and just add a little bit of extra punch.
And if the highlight does end up being a little too thick, you can go back in with some of your oranges and yellows and just knock back a little bit of that strength. And we're going to finish up with a very thin highlight of pure white. We're focusing mainly on this inner square and inner circle. Just a couple of highlights around the edge. Not looking to highlight the entire circle, but we're doing little spots of, uh, of pure white and then we're fading that out towards or around. And this way we create a sort of uh, fade around the circle. Add a little bit to the inner edge on each of the four sides. And then a few dots on the inner circles. And then with our game ink yellow, we want to make sure that our brush has some moisture on there so that when we pull a little bit of color, it's just a smidgen. It'll be diluted and not too heavy. We're not looking to overload the brush. We're just going to gently glaze it into some of the deepest crevices and over some of the inner portions of the circle. And you can see where I'm applying it. It's immediately starting to bump up that richness. It adds a very rich quality to the yellow. It deepens those oranges and adds a very lovely intensity. I'm doing my best not to wash over too much of the white, especially on the inner square. And then where I want it to be super rich, super saturated, I'm just going to do a couple of very thin extra line highlights, especially on the outer ring right here. And then when the ink is dry, we can take our ice yellow and our white and we can just introduce or reintroduce some of the highlights that might have been lost or knocked back a little too much because of the yellow ink. And that's basically how we're gonna be approaching painting the runes. I'm gonna go ahead and paint the other runes front and back, and then I'll walk you through once they're all done, how I approach the highlighting and shading on them, sort of points of contact or um, where I'm determining what's brighter and what's darker and my reasoning behind doing so. And this is what Mortal looks like with all three rings painted. You can see that I've gone brighter on the biggest ring, getting darker and darker and more selective with how bright I'm taking the center spot. The value jump between the three isn't terribly big um, just because the proximity, and I still want them to pop. I don't want them to look unfinished or unpolished. But really it's just the degree or the amount of white and that I'm throwing in there. And you can see that on the biggest ring, it ends up having a lot more work done, a lot more highlighting. And then it's the same with the back, where the contact point reaches between the smoke and the rings is where I've also punched up some highlighting. And you can see here that I've overpainted on the smoke. This is no problem because we're going to be working up from our graphite anyways. And as we're highlighting white, if we do overpaint white on the yellow, much easier to correct than yellow on white. I found that this ring and this ring weren't too bad, but this one, because of the thickness of each of the bars and because I ended up highlighting each bar like a masochist, not overly highlighting, but enough, it did take me probably a couple of hours to get uh, all three of them done. The next step on painting the base is to work on the smoke. Now for this portion of the tutorial, I'm only going to be focusing on one small particular part of the base to show you the process, front to back. We'll be focusing on this front portion here, but the method will be the same all the way throughout with only slight changes in values, which I'll explain as I progress through. The colors I'll be using, I airbrushed a base of AK Graphite when I prepped the miniature. And I'll go back in with the first pass to touch up the overpaints from the yellow and provide a solid base coat to highlight off of. From there, I highlight up through medium sea gray, pale gray, white sands, and white. This is mostly AK with some scale color in the mix. The colors themselves don't matter. This is just a progression through gray. And what I really want to focus on is the technique. You can use whatever colors you want to for your own smoke. 
So I've done my base coat of graphite and I've got all of my gray progression colors loaded onto the palette. I'll be doing a front to back painting on this front portion here. The way I'm going to approach this is similar to the energy runes insofar as placement of highlights and where the bright points are going to be. The smoke is going to push close to white at points of contact with the runes, as well as on some of these extraneous swirls and twists and turns. One of the challenges in painting an organic flowing shape like the smoke is in simulating that rolling motion in the surface material. The way you typically approach painting an object is to determine the faces that are pointed directly towards the light source, and those are your brightest points. And then as the object turns away, and the faces turn further and further away, it gets darker and darker. However, because I also want to treat the entire smoke mass as a flowing entity, we need to start treating it like something like skin, where rather than painting each swirl and bulge as a separate element, we need to also consider the way we work our highlights in a way that connects all of these different shapes together. When you think of painting skin and muscle, it's almost like you have a thin sheet or layer that covers everything and connects everything together. And we want to paint the smoke in the same way. We want to introduce our highlight lines in the crevices as a way to connect all of this smoke and these smoke shapes together. What I love to do as well when I'm painting smoke and fire, I'm a huge fan of Chinese and Japanese art and the stylized way in which they depict smoke and fire. They use a lot of swirls in the folds and in the billows, and I love trying to find ways to incorporate these into my own painting, taking advantage of the open spaces in some of these bulges and shapes to add that extra layer of detail. So what I'm using right now is pure medium sea gray, diluted from the wet palette, and moisture on the brush. And I'm just going in to block in the forms and start working through the different shapes and highlights. And again, considering how I'm connecting all of these shapes as if there were a layer of skin on top of everything. Now where we reach into, or where we expect to reach into eventually pure white, you might want to um, really fill in those, those shadows. As if we were painting hair, um, you don't always want the deepest shadows running continuously through. And then for areas of transition, if you want to mix in a little bit of the graphite in there to help smooth out the transition, we will go back in with an airbrush afterwards and smooth out some of these, uh, these gradients. But the more work that you do now with the brush, the easier it is later when we go to the airbrush. Additionally, because there's these bright yellow runes around it, the more we can reduce overspray or the chance of overspray, the easier our job is. So I'm gonna be as neat as possible and um, attempt to smooth up my transitions as much as possible with the brush, which means using thin coats and blazing and feathering my coats on. From there, we can start introducing our pale gray. This is gonna be um, our major mid-tone. We wanna make sure that we're really getting it everywhere. Not leaving uh, a whole lot of the medium sea gray showing, especially in areas where we're going to have our bright highlights. You can see that I'm really just playing around with the shape of the smoke. Um, as I go in and as I'm highlighting and working my way up, I'm finding areas to introduce more of these swirls. There's no right or wrong way to determine where you want to put them, or these swirls I mean. I like to find as many rolling ball shape forms as I can, introduce them. And then I try and punctuate them with areas of not emptiness, but these flat shapes where they can sort of um, twist and turn and roll into each other throughout the piece. You don't want it to be too busy all the way through, but you don't want it to be too bland or blank. It's about finding that balance between busyness 
and emptiness, which allows the viewer's eye to rest. And we're going to keep working our way through up into pure pale gray. As we reach into the shadow, we can sort of pull it out and not have our highlights go as strong. If you find that you can knock back a shadow, work backwards through some of your colors, introduce more of the medium C gray or work back into the graphite. Bring back some of your deeper shadows if you Now I'm at pure pale gray. And you can see that it has a very neutral, slightly blue tone to it, which does cool down a lot of our, our mid tone. I'm gonna be a little sharper with the highlight here. Swirl now. You can see right here, I'm adding another tendril right there, right in that deep crevice which helps to connect the smoke and reinforce that rolling form. Now, typically when I'm painting um, this kind of a smoke form, I'd be working my way through the highlights all the way through the entire piece because it is important to continue the highlights through. Um, one, to make sure that your values are consistent, but also as a way to connect the forms continuously throughout. The purpose of this tutorial, I'm only focusing on this small subsection. And so when I go back in and continue this highlighting all the way up through the smoke, um, some of these highlights may need adjustments. I may have to extend or shift or balance out some of these forms. So bear that in mind when I do show the final result that this may not be fully fleshed out once I'm finished this uh, recording. And once you've got the pure um, pale gray laid down, we can start to introduce the white sands by mixing it into the pale gray. And the combination of the two helps to keep the highlight color in a fairly cool, neutral range. White sand in and of itself has a bit of warmth to it, but not terribly. It's a, kind of like an eggshell white. And by introducing the pale green in there first, we can keep that cool quality to it until we reach pure white sand. As we work our way up, we can highlight less and less and start to really pick out areas of, of bright contrast. It's important to um, bear in mind when we're painting objects that are super bright, like whites and yellows. Um, A lot of it is representative of the actual color of the object because if you look at reference in nature, um, as an example, white objects, when you look at photos and pictures and whatever, they're never always just pure white. Ambient, environmental, and reflective lighting from everything around them, from even the light source, objects around, etc., all impact and change the tonal qualities of the white. And so part of what helps to sell the illusion that this is a white object um, is our inherent experience and memory of that thing. Um, for example, a white bathtub, a porcelain bathtub in a warm room with yellow temperature lights. 
will appear more yellow and more cream color than actual. However, we understand that bathtubs are typically white, and so even if we see a slightly yellow tone to the bathtub, we understand that this is a white object. What's important is that in some of the brightest spots, we do push what the value of that color will be. And then we can have a lot of fun in the midtones and shadows by adding that tonal variety, that color interest, that helps to make the object interesting without necessarily veering too far away from the intended um, local color of the object. So this smoke, as an example, is gray and white. And we know it to be gray and white because our experience of smoke is typically that it's gray and white. However, we don't have to paint the smoke entirely white. We can focus the white on the brightest points as a way of representing the fact that, okay, yes, the color of the smoke is gray and white, but we're going to be impacting it with bounce colors from the light source, from objects in the surrounding environment, etc. That way, one, it saves us time and effort of having it going to all the way to white over the entire thing. And it helps keep it interesting. I think if the smoke, for example, were just pure white all the way through, or like white with a contrast, administratum gray or something lays on top, it would look very boring, very sloppy. It would draw a lot of attention and it wouldn't look that great, if I'm being honest. So now we're uh, taking the pure white sands and you can see that I'm focusing some really strong highlights right up top here. I want a strong white line in the crevice and I'm almost treating it like a um, pseudo non-metal metal where I want these jumps in areas of bright brights and dark darks. And then again, if you need to correct, just bring back in some of the other mid-tone and shadow tones. I'm not going to spend too much time refining the edge areas just because I need to highlight up the rear elements and then uh, be able to wrap around to the sides. But this area is where I do want to focus on spending a little more time this front portion right here. And once we fit pure white sands, we can take our white and focus some very bright highlights. Now remember, when you're painting with pure white, you're essentially locking in your brightest value. There is no going higher than white, so you need to be careful not to overdo it and be very sparing with it because too much white here will draw too much attention to the top of the model. We still want value-wise um, some of the brightest parts to be on his upper torso and his face. And so when we do the white, we can focus some very extreme spotting here, but as long as the overall value isn't too bright in the white, it's not going to compete with the rest of more. See that as I pull away into these lower rolls, being very, very thin with the white, 
it is diluted, so I'm just glazing it out, helping to smooth that transition. And that's all there really is to it. You can see that by maintaining this sort of off-white white in the brightest parts, we're able to sell the illusion that this is white smoke, even though the majority of this model actually sits in sort of a white sands, pale gray, or pale gray, sea gray, especially near the base here in the deeper shadows. And that's all we're really going to be doing is just slowly working our way through all the smoke, progressing up from our base tones all the way through our highlights, and considering just the natural folds and forms and of the smoke, joining them where necessary, and then where we can add a little bit of extra flair and detail, bring in these kind of swirls and I'll go ahead and paint the rest of the smoke off camera, and then I'll come back and do a uh, post wrap up to show you exactly how I've approached it and um, where I've ultimately placed my final highlights and added those little swirly. And you can see that the smoke has been completely painted. Again, I didn't use the airbrush at all to smooth any of the blends. I just spent the time, probably a good three and a half ish hours. Just working through each of the twists and turns, building up my colors and smoothing up my gradients as I went. The majority of the highlights are the uh, white sands color. And I really only introduce white at the contact points for each of the runes and then the major twists. So the nuance is there, just not super strong. And because I haven't gone overboard with the white, it's not going to draw too much focus away value wise from the rest of the figure. So I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. And it also pays to not have to um, use the airbrush to correct any of the runes either. We're not gonna have any color overspray between the two of them. And this creates a nice separation of the two, I guess, materials of the two objects, the smoke and the energy runes itself. Unfortunately, um, there weren't a lot of these little balls and etc. anywhere else on the rest of the smoke that really let me play around with this sort of Asian style texturing. Um, I was only really able to add a few more swirls into the base elements around. As I got higher up and higher up, it became more wispy and twisty than anything else. And so I wasn't able to introduce more of that flair anywhere else. But I've got a few of them in the base and that's still pretty good for me. So to paint the metallic sewer grate and manhole cover on the base, I'm going to be using a very similar technique to both. I'll walk you through the colors, I'll demonstrate on this flat panel right here, and I've already done a bit of a demo so you can sort of see the look and feel that we're going for. One of the keys to painting non-metal metal isn't so much the colors you use, or not even worrying about perfectly smooth blends. It's about the balance between your darks and your brights. The extreme, I guess, jump between your, your values, and then placing the two side by side to really sell the effect, especially in plane uh, shifts or direction changes of the material surface, to really suggest that this object or this thing is reflecting light around it, it's creating um, reflections of objects around it, and it's bouncing light everywhere. Depending on the materiality of the object, um, whether it's super polished chrome that's going to be very reflective, you're going to have clearer reflections on the surface, or whether it's a more brushed metal uh, look that's going to be much more muted in its reflections. It's really up to you, and you can get away with not having perfectly smooth blends and using the texture and strokes of your brush to suggest a very interesting surface materiality. So what we're going for is something that's much more worn, um, weathered and beaten, something that would see a lot of use from vehicles and foot traffic just walking back and forth all the time. We're getting a lot of scuffs and dings. And so I'll be using a lot of short brush strokes and not really concerning myself with getting super smooth blends. I'm gonna demonstrate again on this flat panel and then I'll walk through the colors for both and really it's the same technique. So to paint, 
So to paint the silver, we're gonna be using four colors. AK Dark Sea Blue is our base coat. And then we're highlighting up in a progression through gray blue, spectrum blue, and ivory. For the sewer grate, we're going for a much more uh, burnished copper sort of feel. So I'm gonna experiment with a new recipe. Um, I may tweak the colors as I paint it and I'll um, cover the tweaks as I go. But we're using Indian Shadow for the base and we'll go through Saddle Brown, Deep Brown. And then I'm gonna try going from Deep Brown into Ice Yellow. This is a bit of a brownish orange color with a hint of red. And Ice Yellow has a pretty strong but pastel -y yellow tone. So I think uh, transitioning between the two in a blend would create some interesting color. So on top of the base coat with our uh, dark blue, we're just gonna start mixing some gray blue. Our light source is from the direction of Mordo's head, so from this direction right here. And the key to remember with non-metal model is that, or any metallic object, is that it behaves like any other object would in terms of how it receives light, how light and shadow play across the surface, and then how it bounces light and reflects it around. The only difference is the more reflective metal um, has it in a much more intense degree than something that would um, not be as reflective like the brick around it. And all we're going to do is we're going to do a lot of um, subtle layers, lots of quick short brush strokes to build up a transition. We're going to be focusing our highlight on this front plane right here. And I might throw in another band right here, uh, right on the edge. And you can see that the really short brush strokes, along with a semi-diluted paint mixture as a result of moisture on my brush and then the moisture from the palette, all help to basically build up this layer of color. And I'm basically layering it up, a little bit of wet blending because my layers might be a little wet as I apply new coats. And then now we're at pure gray blue. So what I'm taking care to do now is I'm also outlining the outer edge. And the reason I'm doing this is because it is a corner, a corner edge. And with metallic objects, they do receive and reflect a lot of bounce light from objects around in the environment. So I'm imagining that the brick around is bouncing light and catching these edges and corners of the metal. And they're gonna receive a little bit of a brighter highlight. Um, you could even go stronger right here because of the smoke and the runic energy and add something even stronger there. And we continue to build this up with our spectrum blue. We're gonna mix it progressively into our gray blue. And it's much the same. We're just making a lot of short brush strokes, building up our layers of color. Now, if you are going for perfect smooth blends, then you're gonna to want to either wet blend or do a lot of smoother layers, do a lot of glazing, a lot of feathering, and even lean on the airbrush using very thin glazes pushed through the airbrush to help smooth out your blends. Um, it really depends on the look and polish that you want, uh, what you want to imply. I'm personally not a huge fan of just mechanically perfect blends. There's something about a painterly brush stroke that I thoroughly enjoy much more. And of course it does help that doing it in this style is also much faster. And now we're just applying another layer of thin your spectrum blue. From here, we start introducing our ivory. And we're really gonna be focusing this on the sharpest corner right here.
making sure that we really sell that texture of these uh, brush strokes are really useful for helping to apply that specular scratched worn surface texture. And we want to make sure that we apply a nice strong ivory highlight on the edge. Do a thin edge highlight right here on this far corner. And that's really all there is to it, at least in the way I'm approaching non metal metal for my Marvel collection. You can see that I've got a nice strong highlight gradient right here. I get that contrast with a dark panel right here where it's angled, it changes. And then once again, brighter here on the flat panel of the sewer grate. I've also applied a very thin bright highlight right in this corner right here, the crevice, because I expect that light will catch in this corner and sort of just bounce and rattle around there, creating a bit of a uh, sort of a light reflection prism thing happening. Now, if you want to do some glazes afterwards to smooth it back or knock back some of the strength, uh, you can take your dark sea blue or your spectrum blue or your gray blue. Make sure it's nice and diluted and just do a very thin coat. Build it up progressively if you want it to go darker or stronger. And make sure that you let each coat dry before you do the next. And that's it. And we'll do the same thing on the manhole cover using our orangey browns and ice yellow. One important thing to keep in mind because of the surface texture of these raised panels, you're gonna to have to be very careful in how you paint it and the time that you spend, I think will directly impact or reflect the quality of the sewer grate. Um, you can dry brush it, you can do a, a wet blend over top and then do a wash. It's up to you. What I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna do a first pass base coat and mid-tone blend all the way through. And then as I highlight, I'm going to highlight intentionally between each of these lines and then specifically highlight the line separately. It'll take a lot more time, be a lot more work involved, but the end result I think looks infinitely better than a dry brush or a simple wash on top. So you can see how I have applied the blend, the highlighting and the shading to the manhole cover. Very similar in style to the sewer grate where it's just a front to back blend, scratchy with the brush strokes, lots of very short movements, to apply the paint. And this allows me to suggest a worn and weathered surface to the manhole cover. For the majority of the manhole cover, it's about a 50-50 mix of my deep brown ice yellow. And then I add a little bit more ice yellow to highlight these raised uh, bars. I don't know what to call them. I'm calling them bars. This is a little rougher than I want compared to the sewer grate. So what I have is a 50-50 mix of saddle brown and Indian shadow. Very diluted. And with the airbrush, we're just gonna very gently glaze in our shadows. This will smooth up our midtones, And this will also have the effect because we're spraying from the direction of our shadows, catching those raised bars and just refining those edges. We're going to spray in two different directions to catch the raised bars on both sides and to slowly build up our color, particularly in the midtone, just to smooth it out. You also want to make sure you're not overspraying onto the khaki around it, but if you do, no problem. Just go back in with a brush and your white sands and just recorrect. And to add a little bit of verdigris, a little bit of extra um, color into the copper, we're gonna use some Nilahack Oxide just to add a little bit of oxidation and rust color to the surface. Because the sewer grate is um, painted with orange, or sorry, the manhole cover was painted with orange, I want to avoid using a, a bright orange for this effect, as I feel like it will get lost. But the Oxide is a cool way to add that oxidization and copper has a tendency to oxidize in this blue bluish green tone 
So this helps to continually sell the effect that it is copper. What we're doing is we're taking a bit of this oxide on our brush and we're just carefully painting it into the crevices where these uh, bars meet. You don't have to do it all over. You can apply it to very select areas. And just take your time and have fun with it. You want to avoid going too overboard and just um, pushing this color everywhere. And then if you want to increase the intensity, just do a couple of extra passes for a brighter finish. And we'll repeat that process over the entire manhole cover. Thanks for watching the video. If you enjoyed it, make sure you give it a like and check out the other two videos in this series. Consider subscribing for more videos weekly. And if you want to follow my other socials, I'll have links in the description below. Until next time, happy hobbying.